Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Puppet Masters and Castle Freaks, the Internet's leading Charles Band related podcast. I get a laugh every time I say that. Uh, I am one of your hosts, Jared Hornbeck, just hanging out, uh, working on my capital punishment Haitian style. And is uh, is there a little mischievous shrunken head who's joining me today? Oh, there sure is. I'm the one with a knife in his mouth uh, because this is the pod. Uh, my name is Steve Gutley, and this is the podcast. It's all about jelly bean addiction, farting zombies, and of course, decapitated teenagers. That's because this is a podcast all about Richard Elfman's shrunken heads. One of the wildest, most unpredictable, weirdest movies that we've watched on this show so far. Uh, so weird, in fact, that we need to bring in a special expert to help us uh, sort through all of this madness. Jared, who is joining us today? Uh, you, you guys are in for a treat, and there was really nowhere else we can look when trying to find somebody to discuss Shrunken Heads with us. Uh, you know him as an author, screenwriter, public speaker, a best, best-selling best author, by the way. You mm. might have read Horror Store or My Best Friend's Exorcism, uh, Final Girl Support Group, or How to Sell a Haunted House, the newest one. I'm talking, of course, about Shrunken Heads uh, expert and aficionado Grady Hendrix. Grady, welcome. Thank you so much for taking time to join us today. You know, I've got to say, I I was knew I was going to be here because never in my life have I seen or heard of a human head made so small to show affection of this sort. <laughs> <laughs> it has to be so, documented. It has to be documented. Meeting. Uh, we are so excited to have you, Grady. Uh, we're really, uh, oh, we're thanks both for such, having me. we are such big fans of your work. Uh, and, uh, yeah, your latest book is just, uh, uh, how to sell a haunted house was really terrific. Um, Thank and, you. uh, yeah, we're, we're really excited to bring in your expertise here. We're, I'm curious about why, so, because, because I just say I could be on other Charles band podcasts. There are plenty of them out there. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. You know, so you got to deal with this vast choose. ocean of Charles. Yeah. Band I, I am really curious. We kind of gave you the run of like whatever one you want to talk about. And you pulled this one and this is such a deep cut. Uh, neither of us had seen this one before. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Steve. I have to admit hmm. something. Oh, sure. In talking to Grady uh, at Mahoning drive in earlier this summer, I said, I told him about the show and he said, only if I can do shrunken heads. Only. Okay. Oh, okay. That was your one and only pick. Okay. Well, how did you come to this movie? So I'm a little late for Charles Band. Like by the time he was doing his thing, I was kind of, I wouldn't want to say a snob, but like <laughs> I, I was very aware of my entertainment dollar and where I wanted to spend it. I was watching, I was at NYU at the time. I was watching a ton of Hong Kong stuff, a ton of uh, Bollywood stuff. Like, you know, and, 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 you know, shrunken heads too, but like stuff like the puppet master series and things, I didn't see those young enough to really forge a nostalgia co connection with it because I feel like those movies, as fun as they can be, a lot of it's the age you see it at, you know? Um, so I know Charles Band stuff, but I didn't connect with very much that he made except for shrunken heads, mm -hmm. which occupied a big place in my life at NYU. So Steve and I often talk about our relationship with horror movies, with low budget movies, walking around the video store, looking at the most outrageous cover art, uh, picking something. So I want to know first, like what your because you you do horror for a living. I mean, I would say that your novels sort of uh, cross genres a bit, but I think it's it's very much rooted in in horror and maybe bringing different aspects of different subgenres of horror. But I, I want to know, like, how you cemented in your life, like when you knew that horror was something that you were going to take with you into adulthood and into your professional life. But then I also want to know, like, how of all once once we get through that, like how of all of the potential full moon <laughs> movies was a trunken heads that was the one that ended up the, the favorite of you and your friends at NYU? Yeah. So I didn't read horror when I was a kid. I read a ton, but I read like military fiction, men's adventure, sci-fi, some fantasy, horror. It was the paperback boom and the covers just weren't my thing. They looked dirty and gross. Um, and so, but you know, I read Stephen King. I, you know, stumbled across the books of blood, the Clive Barker books of blood with those Halloween mass Dell paperback covers. Mm -hmm. And um, I love that stuff, but, and I read some horror, but it just wasn't my focus. And, um, where my entry was for horror with like a lot of people is watching horror movies with my friends. 
like on my birthday every year, like a bunch of us would rent a ton of horror movies and stay up all night at my place oh, and yeah. watch them. And we'd play giant games of like capture the flag or tag out <laughs> in the neighborhood at like three in the morning and stuff. Yes. And then back for horror movies and pizza, then back out, then in. And so like a lot of people, my connection with horror was always social. You know, it was always something you did with your friends. And then later in life, you know, I read more horror. I started writing. My stuff was leaning horror-wise. I started reading more of it. Um, one of the things, though, that I realized as I got older, too, was that um, no one was doing horror in the 2000s. Um, and there's a group of us, like Stephen Graham Jones, uh, kind of mm -hmm. Katsu, although she's a little bit of an outlier, um, Victor Laval a little bit, Paul Tremblay, Mm. where we started um, writing, like, our stuff started getting published in, like, 2012, 14, 15, and there. But we were all coming up from an era where horror was dead. I mean, it was, there wasn't a section in the Barnes & Noble had been taken out for it. Um, the movies were there, but they were pretty looked down on, um, you know. And so it really was a place where you're like, well, if I'm going to do something and I want to do something new and it's more fun to be somewhere where there are not a lot of other people telling you what you can and can't do, horror was where to be. Sci-fi was huge. Corey Doctrow was hit. Boing Boing mm. was ruled the internet. Uh, but we were all horror nerds. Um, it's you know, funny, and around 2015, 2016, I was going to say, is like I at the time I discovered you and – Stephen Graham Jones and Paul mm -hmm. Tremblay. Right. And so, you know, yeah, it yeah. was like, I remember getting my best friend's exorcism when it was new. I remember seeing it like as a staff pick at Barnes and Noble or something. And then uh, be someone being like, oh, you like that? Check out. I think it was a few years later, but like My Heart is a Chainsaw or uh, mm -hmm. Last Final Girl and some of those books. And so I feel like I've always been, I always like get a cluster of the, of all of your, novels and collections and end up reading them in the same summer or over the same stretch of time so i it's funny you name them because i always associate you with them as well yeah i mean yeah. we're all contemporaries you know and we all started getting despite being different in ages that's when we all started getting sort of our breaks you know um but for shrunken head so i went to nyu and a big fixture in your life if you like movies and go to nyu is kim's video oh, so yeah. You know, when I followed the Kims from when it was on the second floor on the corner of St. Mark's and Third Avenue, mm -hmm. uh, and then, or maybe Second Avenue, Second, was it Second or Second? I think it was Second and Second, uh, St. Mark's and Second. And mm -hmm. then, you know, it moved, uh, there was a East Village one, I think, over on A, and then it moved back to where it sort of died finally back on mm -hmm. St. Mark's. It was a Bleecker Street Kims. There were a lot of really good video stores in New York. And I had a bunch of friends we watched movies with and we saw the poster for shrunken heads and we got obsessed with it because um it looked so stupid uh <laughs> and so like the day it came out uh or maybe not the day it came out but like the week it came out uh we used to live in the, the seventh street dorm and next door which is a very small dorm and next door to us was a walk up where our friends Adam Patterson and Jimmy Tr Jenny Treeworgy lived and so my wife Amanda and I and Jenny and Adam can't remember if anyone else was there went and watched Shrunken Heads and we're like this is the greatest movie ever made <laughs> um and it was around the other thing we did at Adam and Jenny's place a lot was they had a Sega and we played a ton of Zombies Ate My Neighbors which oh, yeah. came out like <clears throat> a year before I think is 93 and Shrunken Heads is 94 yeah. mm -hmm. so you know, there was a lot of sort of, um, I don't want to say comedy horror, but that kind of sort of pastiche horror, you know, uh, was big and around. And it was, it was fun. It was different. It was bloody. Like, you couldn't, you couldn't get over the fact that you were slaughtering people, you know? Like, right, like, right. Um, like, if you're playing an action video game, I don't know, it's kind of nerdy. You're machine gunning people. It's, eh. But if it's a horror, you're just macheting you know, zombies. And so it's, it was, it seemed very wholesome. So much well, and the other it. thing that was big around this time too, would have been like Tim Burton and uh, like the yeah. Adams family movie had just hidden really big. So it's like, there, there is kind of this dark Gothic comedy uh, trend going on, which mm -hmm. is why they were considering very briefly releasing shrunken heads theatrically. Like it did that very nearly happened. Uh, really? I don't know that this is the most commercial prospect out there. <laughs> no, uh, 
Steve, I, I'm, in, I'm inclined to agree with you, Steve, but d- before we, we get into the movie proper, because boy, oh boy, do we need to get into this one. Uh, can you fire off a couple stats for us about this Absolutely. Guy? So Shrunken Heads uh, was released May 1st, 1994. This is directed by Richard Elfman, written by Matthew Bright, and it stars Julius Harris, Meg Foster, Eric Egan, Rebecca Herbst, Bo, Sh- Bo Sharon, Darius Love, and Bodie Elfman. Now, this is the reteaming of the creative minds behind one of the great cult oddities of the 80s, and that's called Forbidden Zone. If you haven't seen Forbidden Zone, this is uh, directed by Richard Elfman and his brother, uh, Danny Elfman, who is the great composer, of course. Uh, They formed a theater troupe in the 70s called the Mystic Knights of the Oingo Boingo, which is this very experimental, very weird theater troupe that started to catch an audience. Of course, we know them now as the pop group Oingo Boingo, which they would sort of evolve into from here. But uh, Forbidden Zone was basically like a filmed version of a lot of the stuff they would do on stage. It's extremely absurdist and nonsensical and weird. It stars Hervé Villachez as the king of the sixth dimension that you get there by traveling through the intestines of a house. It is so deeply weird. Uh, but of course, it found a really thriving cult audience, like all, uh, a huge midnight movie uh, that still gets screenings to this day. Like it's still a popular film for uh, that particular crowd. And Shrunken Heads is Elfman's directorial follow-up. He has not directed a film since Forbidden Zone. He uh, co-teamed with Matthew Bright, his uh, childhood friend who co-wrote the uh, script for Forbidden Zone. And uh, Matthew Bright, incidentally, would go on to direct the movie Freeway in 1995, which is a really awesome kind of uh, uh, early Reese Witherspoon movie. He also directed Tiptoes, but we're not going to hold that one against him. (laughs) I was um, wondering if you were going to mention tiptoes. Oh boy, a little Gary Oldman with the shoes on his knees. Uh, that is uh, that is a movie right there. Now, Charles Band shares an amazing anecdote about this movie in his book. So Richard Elfman pitched this idea to Charles Band, who, of course, this is right up his alley. It's like, come on, it's violent, it's goofy, it's got a bunch of tiny terrors. Like, this is exactly the kind of movie I like to make. Uh, and Richard promised to get uh, Danny Elfman on board to do the score. Ultimately, I think he only had time to do the opening theme, but it's a really good opening theme. Uh, and Charles Bandy loved the script. He shelled out for a larger budget than usual, $2.5 million, which was used for the motion ca- cameras and some of the special effects. And uh, Paramount, like I said, was even considering taking this to theaters. They just had a huge hit with the Adams Family, so they're thinking, all right, yeah, dark and weird horror comedy could have a market. And everything seemed to be lining up. And then they had a focus testing group. And it, the problem that they ran into, that Charles Band said, the problem that they had was that he, he learned that there's a reason that you cast people in their early 20s or late teens to play teenagers in movies. It's because they read a little older. When you cast actual teenagers, their actual age, these kids are between the ages of 14 and 16. They look like kids, okay? They look like very, very young kids. And when the the turning point in this movie came when the children are murdered and then have their corpses (laughs) desecrated, when you're seeing that happening, uh, you are very, very conscious of the fact that these are small children that this is being done to. So Paramount, uh, they they pulled the theatrical option off the table, and uh, Charles Band says he did not blame them for that one bit. So like Grady, I saw the poster for Shrunken Heads before I seen the movie. Uh, spoiler alert to our listeners. Steve and I only watched this movie for the first time two days ago. Mm-hmm. So we are coming into this with very fresh eyes. But when I saw the poster, I mean, you see the shrunk, the name of the movie is Shrunken Heads. You see it's got kids. It's got shrunken heads. Okay, well, are the shrunken heads like, do they help the kids? Are the shrunken heads the kids? You could have given me until the end of my life and I would not have been able to come up with the actual plot line of this movie. Right. Cause they if, were, they were setting up like even the tagline, the tagline on the VHS is they are superheroes from their head to their neck. All right. Mm-hmm. They are setting up with all the DC imagery that's throughout this whole movie that these kids are going to be superheroes uh, of some sort. That is in no way what these kids are. No, that these is are not the, what they, they become. These are the Paul Kersey of, uh, you know, of Haitian voodoo uh, shrunken well, heads. Well, and, and they really treat them in the movie like superheroes. They shoot them, you know, in a very Batman and Robin kind of way. Yeah. Like, you know, the poppy Sam Raimi colors and things of Darkman. 
Uh, oh, I thought and... you meant the way they literally shoot these kids. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> um, more than once. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. But also, uh, but also Danny Elfman, you know, that theme song and then, you know, Charles Band riffs on it, but it mm. really sounds like the Batman music when they're flying over the city and going into the alley to beat up the muggers. You feel like you're watching kid Batman. You yeah, there really is a sense that like each one has their own unique <clears throat> powers. Like one of them yeah. has vampire fangs, one of them has a switchblade that he pulls out of his mouth, and the other one has electrical abilities, you know. So yeah. they all have their own powers, like a superhero group, but that's really not what they are. Like these kids don't really have any autonomy once they become head. Or I guess I should say they get the autonomy sort of beaten out of them. I think they they even have a line saying like uh the more we fester our hate, like we that we lose our humanity or something like that. Yeah. And they just become literal puppets for this disgruntled newsman who used to be part of Papa Doc Duvalier's secret hit squad. Like, <laughs> what's what? his superpower? Oh, torturing and waterboarding people and making their bodies disappear. I mean, yes. I, no, and also their magical yeah. chant um, it includes Haile Selassie, who yeah. I know is someone that a lot of people are very committed to as a sort of political religious figure. He was also a bit of a war criminal, you know, and, and committed. Like, like there is a weird edge to this where you're kind of like, did Matthew Bright just grab these things because he thought they were cool and quote unquote exotic? Or was he doing something subversive with them? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I had to look up what the Tauntaun Makut was, but, like, they were not good guys, you know? Like, Mr. Sumatra is not squad. a hero. <laughs> yeah, they were not, you know, m like most death squads, not super nice. Um, no. Yeah. <laughs> they, uh, but also, Mr. Sumatra is not super nice. That's not. one of the weirdest things in this is, for all the for all of the fact that this exists in kind of the world of it, the mini series, you know, mm -hmm, small mm -hmm. town where the grocer packs up your groceries and they're reading comic books and everything. And it's basically one outdoor set that like, you know, they just use over and over. Yeah. It's these kids are gunned down in the street. Their corpses are mutilated <laughs> on camera. Mm hmm tortured they're turned into blood hungry automatons who like you were saying Stephen, they're every time they do something violent their humanity fades right they are dedicated to nothing but taking horrible revenge on people it's really hey gross. that's not true they also try to go up a girl's shirt don't they don't try they do they, they do. succeed in a, in a shot that made me very uncomfortable that is a very young girl we should not be looking at that but yeah although it, although i think i think and i'm only saying this because um i can't think of the other way i think they built an enormous pair of prosthetic breasts covered oh, by her they? bra because that seems to be the actor's face playing the shrunken head yeah leaning in there so if that's i don't think it's an optical effect i think they had him made him up and leaned his head in there so i think they just built a giant fake 15 year old girl's cleavage that must have been a weird day at work for the special effects guy i gotta say that must for be a, everyone if you want me to do what now yeah, yeah. i love great i didn't you catch mentioned that. that this is this is like a singular set small town but it's also very much like New York City. It's like the beginning of a Bronx tale in this yeah, movie yeah, for yeah. some reason. And it's like, do you remember? Okay, you remember the movie Streets of Fire? Yeah. Yes. So they have, it's like Streets of Fire is like a rock and roll fable. And they describe the setting as another time, another place, I think it is. Is what they just say. Like that's that's yeah. when it, it's another time, another place. I feel like that applies here because they yeah. have, it, it's very urban in the way these kids sort of talk to each other and their accents and mannerisms. And then, I mean, Vinny and, and Booger enter the scene and I forget the name of the other. Uh, yeah. Podowski. Yeah. yeah. Podowski. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's weird because that, there's some heavy New York accents. There's some, a lot of people who can't seem to say the word Booger. Yeah, they, well, it, it's, 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 they struggle with that one. It's greasers. It's like literal greasers yeah. in 1994, which were not a thing. I mean, I didn't grow up in New York or anything, but they, I don't think they were a thing on the streets. It's a shared in universe with Friday the 13th 5. Kind yeah. of. All of a sudden, yeah, there's yeah. greasers for no reason.
Well, I mean, also there's a... greasers who ride around in a yellow station wagon. Yeah, yeah. And they take orders from like an androgynous Meg Foster playing a character named Big Mo, which is a, a really interesting take on the, the gangster character. But yeah, no, this movie does feel uh, it's kind of out of time. And I've, there's a there's a really intentional artificiality to the sets. I think it felt like nothing less than Sesame Street to me. Like that's mm. that's kind of the vibe I got. Like they were going to go knock off. Mr. Well, there's Cooper a moment a second. when the when the gang they the camera comes around the corner and the gang saunters into frame like it's West Side Story. Yeah, like, yeah. They, no, they, they, it's actually West Side Story music on the track. Like, yeah, <laughs> they, you could hear a little bit. Then, like, Officer Krupke comes up to harass him. Like, it was crazy. And the other thing I thought was weird about the score is, and I actually think this is actually one of my more my one of my fav not favorite. I really like Danny Elfman's theme music for this. I actually think it's one of his better scores. Like, it's for the, what he was working with. Charles Band does a great job, but for some reason they keep playing gymnopedes by sati on this like <laughs> the 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 modernist french composer mm -hmm. and they even thank him in the they don't credit him but they say a special thanks to sati and i'm like what is going on this movie is made of so many random jumbled things squished together it's yeah, it's really like somebody bizarre. yeah somebody sent them the music track for mo better blues and instead, it's yes, yeah. <laughs> we we get shrunken heads instead. And it, it there's so much that's really weird about this. I mean, you have Vinny, who is about 25, who has a really heavy. I mean, rest assured, he's walking here with that yes, accent. Absolutely, he, he looks kind of like Tom Holland, like Spider Man's Tom Holland. I, I couldn't mm -hmm. kind of get over that. And then Podowski, I mean, that guy is hanging out with what looks like and bullying children. He is clearly the same age and like size that John Goodman was in 1994. Yeah. What, who is this King Ralph up in here? Come on. What are we doing? Yeah, no, it, it there's, it's hard to kind of like zero in on exactly what the intention behind all this weird amalgam of characters that like of themes is it feels sort of like it's a takedown of the child in peril movie, kind of like a, like a, like a parody of the Goonies, like a dark twist on something like that. And, uh, but it, it's adding that horror element. And then, yeah, just having that element of having these very young kids at the center of all of this makes it deeply weird. Uh, it's hard to wrap your head around, but it's also impossible to stop looking at. Yeah. Well, it's also weird because as much it's, there were things in it that I agree. It feels totally out of time. Like Vinny, this hardened criminal gives um oh gosh what's her name jenny the girl yeah sally mm -hmm. is it sally, sally. oh sally like, yeah gives sally like a gold heart locket that says Vinny and sally like it's some weird children's picture um but then you also keep getting reminded that they're in the 90s you know mm -hmm. a lot of bare midriffs um and the i don't know if anyone else is a comic book nerd but did you notice when they're reading comic books at, at mr sumatra's stand they're not reading like i expect they'd be reading something like production department would have created you know to look timeless like they're reading like dc 90s comics they're reading mm -hmm. bloodlines which was yeah. like one of these giant events dc tried to engineer that is terrible it's about like alien dragons that drink people's spinal fluid and it's so edgy and 90s and i remember they tried to launch a comic from it called um Razor, sh razor sharp, and the cyber rats. Like, oh my god! Get, I remember that. Yes, it does not get more nineties than razor sharp and the cyber rats. And there they are, you know, in bloodlines. So the movie is so weird and yet so accomplished too. Those motion control shots, that that the city models they built look fantastic. They I do. have to say, yeah. I was really surprised at how just how good those looked to me. Like. I mean, you, you get what they're doing. You get the trick, the, the, you know, but I watched the video zone showing the sets that they built and how, how they set up those shots. And I mean, I don't even remember like speaking of Elfman, I mean, his amazing uh, opening theme to Beetlejuice playing mm -hmm. over that tracking shot over the model. Yeah. Like there's a little bit of that in here. I mean, like, I think those city, the, the big, you know, city shots like that, when the camera's kind of swooping through, 
it looks really fun. Like it, it just has the same energy as some can something can't be, but totally enjoyable, like the tick or something yeah, like right. that, which, and I'm, I'm all for it. I mean, if you listen to the show, you'll hear Steve and I profess our love for practicality. And even mm -hmm. if it's something that's dated, or even if it's something that's cheap or a way to a little sleight of hand, like we're always here for it. And like, like stop motion and things of that nature the, yeah, these, the, the city shots on that were, were real, I, I was having a ton of fun with it. Well, Absolutely. but also there's a weird kids thing too, because one thing you guys aren't talking about, and I don't know if you just, this, this hurt you so recently that you haven't <laughs> processed all the hurt. But when the kids attack people, usually what happens is um, one of them has a switchblade in his mouth and slashes their throat. And then uh, the other one has fangs and sucks on their blood for three hours in one moment. Um, mm. And then Tommy has lightning electrical powers and he shoots him in the brain. And this results in them being turned into farting zombies <laughs> that pick up the garbage and clean up for feeding <laughs> this is an absolutely insane development like when this came up it's like okay yes this is farting zombies whose only purpose is to clean oh my God. uh the the crime that they've been doing now again we M mr sumatra has not really expressed a lot of um uh, a rage about this particular point i think he's casually said like oh there's a lot of crime on these streets oh these yeah. guys are a bunch of bums uh like maybe it was the murder of the kids that kind of drove him over the edge but like it feels like he's really got an axe to grind that uh did not appear anywhere earlier in the movie so there's kind of a disjointed thing but that is kind of the one part of this mythology that is haitian if i'm correct right because shrunken heads are not actually a voodoo practice. No, I it's, don't think it, so. It's like an Amazonian tribes thing. So they're kind of like mm. conflating like a little bit of jungle cruise and a little bit of uh, uh, things like that. I, <laughs> I did a deep dive and discovered a, uh, an old toy kit called Vincent Price's Apple uh, Shrunken Heads yes. things. Yeah, where yeah. You, could, you could turn an apple into you a dry shrunken an head. apple, yeah. <laughs> I want to get that right now. Um, but yeah, they, they, this kind of idea of shrunken heads had been around in our pop culture, but it's not really part of the Haitian mythology in any way that I understand. Yeah. Um, so like we're getting all this weird amalgam of different uh, well, magical abilities. And then like Grady said, the, then it just, not only do they become farting zombies, but then they're going and they're picking up litter and throwing it in the dumpster. I mean, did we just take a left turn into like Tromaville? Because yeah, kind of. Yeah, that's scary. what the, that aspect of the movie feels like. It's such a yeah. It's such, this movie is wild. <laughs> so one thing I just want to take a minute for yeah. um, is Sally's arc. Um, it's very strange. So Sally is Vinny's girlfriend when we meet her, and mm -hmm. she looks like she's about fifteen years too young for him. Yes. Uh, he looks like he's in his mid to late twenties, and I think is in his mid to late twenties, and she is fifteen, I think. Yeah. Um. So then, she really has a thing for Tommy, and she's had a thing for Tommy ever since they were kids together. She later confesses, but she never thought he would like her back. And so then she kind of falls for Tommy, and I guess they're kind of they aren't really going out. They're going out, but as friends, kind of. Mm -hmm. then Tommy's murdered and she's traumatized. Vinny reassures her he's going straight because that's so terrible. And for a year, she and Vinny are a couple until Vinny tries to have sex with her on a date after a movie and she throws him out or he makes her walk home. Then she encounters Tommy's head at his grave and he <laughs> flies up her shirt non-consensually. <laughs> Then she confronts Mr. Sumatra, who explains to her that everything's okay. She's like, this is horrible what you've done to these boys. And he's like, no, 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 it's good. It's revenge. <laughs> when she accepts them, sees Tommy, consensually lets him fly up her shirt. Then she becomes a voodoo priestess who's going to be the inheritor of Mr. Sumatra's powers. And at the end, seems quite happy with the way everything's gone and turned out as the well, I mean, it's heads a, die. It's a tale as old as time really yeah <laughs> it's that that tired old trope yeah it's i mean such no, a, it's such a regular character arc 
there was such a, a a jarring time jump between when the kids yeah. become shrunken heads. And I then was going to say, why is there's it a, a year? Yeah, there's a jarring one yeah. year later because I guess – like again at this point i'm still thinking okay so these guys are going to become little crime fighters or something they're going to go around uh, uh equipping and fighting and everything but i mean and they do kind of but it's they need to be broken first i guess which is so like is the year there because matthew bright thought the audience isn't going to buy that they've lost their humanity and have such good control over their shrunken head powers in like a week or two weeks. It's got to be a year to be that convincing. It has to be a conven a time jump for convenience and for plausibility as much as I hate but, using that word to describe anything. In but not, nothing else significant seems to change in that year. That's the thing. Like, no. like Jenny is still, or uh, Sally is still dating uh, the, Vinny. the Vinny guy. And like they haven't really gone any further. Like she hasn't like you would expect maybe in a year, like she's either more embroiled in this lifestyle or she's broken free of him. And it doesn't look yeah. like any of that has happened. And uh, I would suggest Jared, the movie has done nothing to show it has any concern with plausibility up until yes. this point. <laughs> Very uh, true. This, this is fair. I like to think that somewhere there's a deleted scene of like a montage of the year is just them honing their skills. It's just like, Freddie trying to whip the switchblade around and it falls out. And then Mr. Sumatra has to pick it back up and put it back on. There's a, a really fun 80s tune that kicks in when they're finally starting to get it. You're the and best. All right. Exactly. And then 300. <laughs> well, they do just, use an Oingo Boingo tune later in that they car do. chase. I yeah. mean, so No One Lives Forever, classic song that you may associate with Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 mm. because mm. it's you. It's used... Uh, Sorry to say this, everyone, to slightly better effect in that movie than it is here. But I was like, hey, you know, that was kind of cool. And also um, in the video zone, I, I saw that Richard Elfman prefers to be uh, referred to as Rick Elfman. Oh. Mm. At least so, at this time he did. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so I, that's so I, I, I will refer to him as Rick for convenience. But sure. Rick, you know, must have said to Danny, like, hey, can we uh, license something from uh, Oingo Boingo to to use in the movie, and they chose "No One Lives No One Lives Forever," which is one of my all time favorite songs. And when it started playing in this movie, I was agog. Did I use yeah. that word correctly? You did. And that's also it's playing over Rick's scene as the preacher of the Church of the Apocalypse. Um, yeah. <laughs> that guy that is big. Yeah, if you watch yeah. him in the video zone, he is a big personality. He's just very expressive and very excitable, and like he seems like a fun guy. Well, also that, you know, his booger is played by his son. Uh, mm -hmm. God, I can't remember the son's name. Bodie. Uh, Bodie, Bodie, Bodie Elfman. Bodie Elfman, who was at the time dating Jenna Elfman, who he mm -hmm. would later marry of Dharma and Greg fame. Um, yeah, still married, I believe. Scientologists yeah. together. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then there's an elder Elfman, one of the elderly couple who talks about that there's a bad smell coming from Mr. Sumatra's apartment. Those are uh, those are both Elfmans. That's his grandmother and his father. Yeah, it is really. Yeah, wow. yeah, real wow. family affair. It's a talented family. It is. And I their mean, mom Blossom actually wrote a great book. Um, she was a at one point a teacher at a home for unwed mothers, and she wrote a novel based on her experience called The Girls of Huntington House that got made into a TV movie starring Sissy Spacek. Uh, and oh. it's actually a really, really good book. Wow. Okay. I wasn't familiar with that book. So I mean I want to ask you guys a question. What is this movie's <laughs> obsession with grabbing balls? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, what is what is society's obsession with that? That's what I want to say. I'm holding up the mirror. You know, I, I think it's just saying that. I mean, I, I will say there there are some there are a couple of decent kills in this. I especially liked the Vinny kill of the shrunken head flying through the windshield and lodging itself in his mouth. Very fun, uh, which is real gross and really funny. Uh, and, you know, there, there's a couple of like a good little gory moments here. But again, you have this jarring shift between like what is essentially a kid's film and then like a hard r rated horror film yeah and i'm just i'm i'm wondering why they chose and i mean i don't i don't want a monday morning quarterback this absolute masterpiece but i'm wondering why they chose to make the kids slaves as shrunken heads and not just because when they first come out of it they're conscious they remember things like they still like jelly beans for god's sake like they're they have their faculties about them and they would probably want revenge. 
And so it feels like such a weird choice to uh, take that year to beat the humanity out of them, which they never truly get back. Tommy does a little bit, but like they never mm -hmm. truly get that back. And I'm just like, would this be a more fun movie if they were aware of what they were? I mean, it's a pretty fun movie, but I mean, would this be a more palatable commercial movie if they were aware of what they were doing? Man, you know, it That's is a good question. The, 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 one of the things that I think is so disturbing about this movie is ultimately you were talking about three 14 to 15 year old boys who are decapitated and live as shrunken heads to a man they seem to both adore and fear. You know, they call him the master and he blows that show far and they come, they come flying, <laughs> but like they, they, they also seem to somewhat, he, he's kind of not nice. No. And you wonder like, what's their existence like? How bleak and empty is it? And then you get to that ending where like, um, uh, the, the one who eats the Wizzo jelly beans gets gets shotgunned in the face and yeah. Freddy gets run over and crushed. And I mean, it's just, it's bleak. And it, we never really get a moment of reckoning where the movie's like, oh yeah, Mr. Sumatra is not such a nice guy. He just kind of gets to be the Professor X of yeah. the Shrunken Heads yeah. crew the entire time. All we so, really yeah. get is Tommy's aside about tears in the rain. It's really weird. Yeah, yeah. It's this whole thing. Yeah. yeah. But it's also, so after Tommy goes into Vinny's mouth and he gets shot and explodes, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And they run over Freddy a few times. And the other one, I can never remember the jelly bean fan's name. Um, Bill. Yeah. Bill. Bill. Okay. Yeah. Um, and he gets shot also. Do they ever come back? I know they, they're back at the apartment. They pick them up. They're back at the apartment. They're, but he says they're sleeping. And then they fly away, right? Yeah, it seems to imply that there's there's a greater like shrunken heads averse that they were building towards. You know that there's going to be a, a further adventures of the shrunken heads as they fly away. Like I I'm uh, that was my understanding is that they okay. were going to regenerate while they were in that box or something, or that they yeah. couldn't be killed by traditional methods. But it sure looked like they were dead. Yeah. 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 I mean, because I would imagine it would they would probably be doing anything uh, that they possibly could within their power to set this up, to turn this into some kind of a franchise. I mean, given what we know about Charles band and, and they full moon. I mean, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I I'm surprised they weren't trying to write a sequel and shoot it at the same time as this one, mm -hmm. like they, you know, did with some subspecies and with oblivion and a few other movies. Maybe it was budget. I mean, is two and a half million big for full moon. Average full moon is probably about 700k. Yeah, so this is this so, is uh, far and away like one of their more expensive productions. I mean, yeah. you know, to for what it's worth, I feel like it's on screen. Like I think, oh, yeah, you could see some of the seams in it, but uh, I think the special effects kind of hold up. Like they're they're yeah. really not bad. I think the shrunken heads themselves actually look pretty good. I mean, yeah. right. when the the flying effect is is dated and and whatever, and you can you can very clearly see how they achieve that. But the actual props of the shrunken heads, and I was watching in the video zone, they were talking about how they had to take full size casts of the kids' heads, and then there was a medium sized one when the kids' heads are boiling in the cauldron, <laughs> and then there's the small ones, and just like the attention to detail in doing them was. A lot of craftsmanship went into them, and I thought they came out looking pretty good. Like they yeah. they they capture the qualities for the most part of of those kids' heads. I just want to talk. Like there are two things that jumped out to me, and I, I have them jotted down, and I wanted to bring them up because they were, were legitimate laughs. So I think what's so enjoyable about a movie like this is. You can laugh at it and you can laugh with it. It's just one of those things where you can watch it and you can find something ludicrous that they're doing sort of earnestly or sincerely. Or or, or maybe this is, like you said, Grady, maybe we're asked, maybe this is more subversive, some of it, than we're thinking. But there was this, the scene when Big Mo is sending Vinny after the kids and she keeps taking progressively larger guns out of her trench coat. Yeah. It yeah. gave me a, a legitimate laugh. And then after the kids are killed, that their services are just one service with three caskets. <laughs> like mm -hmm. the families don't get to grieve on their own. It's like, like they were lost at sea or something. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's like, no, these kids are bound together. Now they're families and they just are met. in it for the long haul. And they just met Freddie like a week ago. 
Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah like, Sally like, couldn't even remember his name. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I mean, yeah. Like, I, I think you make a good point about like, it, I, I, if there's something subversive going on under the surface here, the, the meaning behind it isn't entirely clear. Like think about like the big Mo character, like, is this Richard Elfman playing around with gender stereotypes and playing around with uh, uh, like kind of queer uh, uh, representation or is he making fun of lesbians? Like it's yeah. not entirely clear what the joke with Big Mo is or what the purpose of Big Mo is. Um, not that like Meg Foster is not giving a very committed uh, fun performance here under all her pillows or whatever that she's wearing under that shirt. But But yeah, I mean, some of the some of the the message is a little muddled in the execution i think like well, it's, it's just yeah. that uh, she's kind of butch looking and you have mitzi who's like her miss test mocker hanging right. around in there but there's no they never really establish a romantic relationship it's sort of although implied. most oh, I'm sorry, most preferred pronouns are definitely he him i mean yeah. he's referred to as he he him throughout um but, you know, drag culture and club culture was big when this came out. Um, yeah. You know, Tu Wong Fu, uh, Thanks for Everything, uh, or Thanks for Everything, the Patrick Swayze, John Luziano, yeah. Wesley Snipes, that was like a year away. You yeah, know, so it was uh, Pris Priscilla, Priscilla Queen of the yeah. Desert. Yeah. Priscilla Queen of the Desert. Yeah. RuPaul was a huge, I mean, a, as big as you could get without being on, like, network TV. Yeah. Uh, she yeah. had Supermodel was a big hit. So drag culture was a thing, you know? And so I, I but again, it's one of those things where, like, did any of y'all see Matthew Bright's, the movie he wrote right before this, Gun Crazy, the remake of the noir this no, the standard I've only bullet one. Seen, I've only seen the John Dahl and Peggy Cummins, the 1949, 1950 yeah. one, so which is they did a phenomenal movie. Yeah, it's a great movie. They did a remake with Drew Barrymore and James LaGrosse uh, mm. that came out right before this. It might even have been the same year that Matthew Bright wrote. And that has something of the same problem in that there's nothing wrong with it, but you kind of wish someone had a point. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, what's yeah, yeah. the point here? Um, you're, you're remaking this movie. You're updating it. You're throwing in some some gritty sexual abuse and stuff. But what ultimately is the point? And Drew Barrymore gives a great point. But it's like this. Like, it wouldn't have been hard to take one more step and subvert those superhero tropes. I mean, Dark Man was 1990. You know, mm, like, yeah. just one more step <clears throat> and, and, and subvert them. Or another step and different and embrace them but this movie sort of hovers in the middle and sticks a lot of things together that are fun but like they're all pulling in different directions well and i think that has a lot to do with the fact that full moon's basic like model of operations was home home video mm -hmm. and i think it was i i think in order to really commit and subvert you might alienate some of your perspective i mean this is a rated r this is a hard r movie I is mean, it it's we, rated r it yeah. is. We wow. yeah. we don't get any um, actual nudity in the movie, but we get a lot of profanity, and we get uh, you know murdered children, and we get uh, you know some farting zombies yeah. and revenge. I mean, this is so, and I think I think maybe even like having bringing this thing on an R was already sort of a compromise. I can imagine Charles Band in his mind wanting it to skew a little more child friendly, only because. There could be a crossover with his, you know, the newly started Moonbeam Entertainment of stuff right. they're putting out really just for kids. And I think if you see the cover of this, like a kid is going to be drawn to that cover. And so I think they, 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 there was a little give and take about how serious this should be and how subversive or how broad should some of the stuff play so that kids can laugh at things and not be scared of it. But there's also some gore and profanity well, for adults. Like this is, this is just a strange piece. There, there is like, I did clock it, it when this happened, like you, we don't get our first F bomb in the movie until after the kids get shot. And then it's immediately like yeah. that. So there is kind of a weird like split point in the movie it's like okay we've stopped being a kids movie now it's gore now it's f-bombs like it, it, there is kind of a specific point where that happens which again makes me feel like there's something more operating under the surface here mm -hmm. um or, or that this is just meant to be maybe it's just meant to be kind of like a demented 
takeoff of a kid's film. You know, like maybe they're starting with that blueprint and then just twisting it. But you really wonder, it wouldn't have taken much to make this PG-13. Um, no. <laughs> so maybe <laughs> it's just not. the concept that these kids get murdered, decapitated, and their decapitated heads take revenge that's going to get you an R, no matter what. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. No matter <laughs> how you play it, a script with that in it is going to be an R. Which the MPA are a, such sticklers for child I decapitation. Am, ugh, ugh, funny it's duddies. such a mistake, I feel like, because the one place in my experience that ever police the r rating and the age of the viewer of the patron was a video store yeah you know and i remember back in the day like clerks would be like i can't rent you this i will get in trouble yeah. um you know like and i'd have to get my sister to rent an r movie even if i was standing <laughs> right there um and so it's like did they really think an r movie like this had a big adult audience like how did this do do we know i i think they kind of buried it honestly like this one's fairly obscure even for full moon fans like i uh, i think charles band doesn't seem to be particularly happy with the yeah, way it all so came together steve and i were talking on mic uh, off mic i should say about this uh and wondering like what charles band's feeling is about this movie is he trying to like bury this does he look back fondly on it i mean there's no shrunken heads to or beyond yeah. so i i wonder if they sort of look at this as a as an experiment between band Elfman and Bright, where what they really wanted to do was subvert, subvert expectations and really uh, play with the conventions of a kid's movie and push the envelope, because I feel like it, it is really intentional. And that shift, Steve, like you said, when it turns into a hard R, mm -hmm. it, what yeah. I love about that is it makes this and Grady, I'm sure you'll back this sentiment up. It makes this the perfect like midnight movie, like introduce this movie to your friends after you've, you know, been drinking or you're, you're sitting down or you want to see something crazy because no one will predict that this movie is going to take that hard R turn mm -hmm. that it takes. And I think it, it was kind of like shocking, but you know, for me watching it for the show, I was delighted. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I could honestly go on about this all day, but I know, Grady, you've uh, you've got a hard out, and I want to give you a minute to um, uh, plug your stuff and um, no. uh, tell us where we can where we can find your amazing books. I will just say, personal plug, I read How to Sell a Haunted House this year. It is my favorite book that I've read all year. No exaggeration, oh, and I'm not just saying that because you're here. We're already in September. There's not yes. much time for you to replace it. Not uh, much time, yeah. Steve, really can bad. I jump on your, your uh, endorsement yeah. there? So I also read How to Sell a Haunted House in the beginning of the summer. It was also my favorite book that I read this year. And I had the same thing happen when I've read for the first time My Best Friend's Exorcism and Final Girl Support Group, which was probably like 2017 and 2021. Those ended up being my favorite books of the year when I looked back on what I had read. So we were not blowing smoke, Grady, when we said that we're fans yeah. of your work. Like we we thoroughly uh, enjoy your prose. And we the, the, the newest book, everybody, How to Sell a Haunted House, you, you got to grab it. It's fantastic. But yeah, no, a ton. Tell us uh, anything you want to plug and where people can find you. you know, I'm look just, out for. Uh, I, uh, I've been holed up all summer doing rewrites on the book that's coming out next summer. Um, and so I'm just sort of emerging. I've got a bunch of events I'm doing this year. And I, I usually do a show rather than an event. It's like a one person show. Um, you know, it's, it's, you've seen it at Camp Blood stuff mm -hmm. or at Mahoney. Um, although that was a audio kind of version, but it's usually one hour and it's about serial killers or uh, murder books or haunted houses and the economic problems thereof, or I sing it's, it's so, and it's an hour. So like, if you don't like it, it's over pretty fast. They're amazing. But, um, Having seen them, I can tell you, okay. and the one you did for sub final girl support group with oh. how you, how you ended up getting to Adrian King and sort of the, 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 uh, idea for for that book was really, really phenomenal. I, I saw that a couple of years back when you did that one. And that was just uh, amazing. The amount of time and work you put into those presentations. Oh, thanks. Um, so I've got some coming up, but honestly, I gradyhendrix.com is my website. So I'm going to list them there as soon as I'm able to um, on the page labeled events. So yeah, just gradyhendrix.com. And then there's a book out next summer, but that's a long time to ask people to remember anything. <laughs> 
Well, that's amazing. Well, uh, truly, it was it was so fun to talk to you about this movie, and uh, oh. uh, thanks thanks for bringing it to our attention. No, I feel like I've <laughs> I've done God's work. To, you to, have to bring shrunken heads in, into your viewing rotation. Oh, Saint Saint Grady, yes, yeah, we're, we're, I don't we're canonizing know. you. <laughs> I don't know where this movie would have ended up in our spreadsheet had you not sort of pushed it to the forefront. And I'm I'm a richer man for having seen this movie now um and you know what Richer like, in some ways poor in others perhaps but i don't i don't necessarily walk away from all of these films feeling like this is one i'm going to revisit i mean we've had there are a few even ones we've done so far where i'm like oh i really like this a lot and it'll go into rotation i'll throw it on once a year once every other year or something like that I will probably watch this again soon. And I think my goal is going to be find one of my friends who loves low budget trash and who hasn't seen this and just force it upon them <laughs> first, because I had an absolute blast watching this movie. It's not a perfect movie. It's flawed and muddled in a lot of ways, but uh, it it is fun and it takes some swings. And I, my jaw, I was texting Steve just phrases. Holy shit. Holy yeah. shit. <laughs> There's a lot of those. Yeah. While while we were watching it. But uh no, and well, uh, Grady, I'm sure I'll see you probably at a Mahoning drive in event at some time at some point in the near future or uh and so I look oh, yeah. forward to to those events. Uh listeners, if you enjoy what we do, uh tell a friend. Also jump on to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you're listening, and drop us a five star review. If you feel so inclined, you can write a nice brief uh, rating. I meant you could write a review if you want to and say some kind words. Also, you can email us at, at puppetmasterscastlefreaks at gmail.com with any questions, comments, or feedback. Uh, you can follow me on Instagram at underscore Cowboy Jerry. You can follow Steve at Minotaur Matador. And you can follow the show at underscore puppet or at puppetmasters underscore castle freaks. And uh, Steve, can you just let our gentle listeners know what we've got in store for next week? Oh, my goodness. We've got a big one coming up next week as well. Uh, we are going to be talking about the movie Killjoy. Yes, that's right. A killer clown movie. I don't think that's been done before. So I'm excited uh, to see this. what they do with that. Yeah, a whole mm -hmm. franchise, a little a little uh, late stage uh, 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 full moon franchise. Hopefully not as tough to sit through as Evil Bong, but and uh, we'll super see how exciting that goes. because we've got another uh, very special guest to joining us, Stevie Webb from the Amazing Brain Rot podcast. I know UK listeners will be very familiar with the work that he does, so he'll be joining us. And he also recommended this movie, so this is another like oh <laughs> conditional. I got to do it if I can do Killjoy. But uh, so, yeah, listeners, thank you so much uh, for tuning in every week. Again, Grady, thank you so much for joining us. And we will see all of you next week for Killjoy. Killjoy.